Well, guys, thank you once again for joining us uh, this week for Youth Group in- Online in lieu of our usual midweek uh, in-person youth group and while I wish we were here in this room together face to face I am grateful for the ability that we have to be able to do this virtually uh, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, be back here in person again sooner than expected um, well if you missed last week's lesson on politics I want to encourage you to please go back and take some time to to give it a listen because this week's lesson is really kind of a, a continuation a, 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 just another thought uh, in that same uh, atmosphere of politics politics and all especially um and we're talking about last week we talked about where our allegiance lies and this week we're talking about our our opposition uh the people we may disagree with or not get along with uh and things like that um and i believe it's important for us to talk about that especially in light of our current cancel culture that we're surrounded by um see in the last few years terms like online shaming uh call out culture and and cancel culture uh, have become popular but it's not always clear what these words actually mean Uh, because you think what does it mean to call out what does it mean to shame someone what does it mean to cancel someone Uh, and these terms can be pretty confusing because they're sometimes used interchangeably Uh, you know some people say canceled as a joke uh, like canceling people who put pineapple on their pizzas which I I have before and I kind of like it so you can cancel me if you want Um, some people use it to fuel celebrity drama, like when a celebrity supports something that you disagree with or they do something you don't like, things like that. Uh, we tend to cancel them or shame them and call them out. Um, some people use social media to embarrass or hurt each other, um, maybe for a laugh at times or, or maybe even for revenge. Uh, and other people call out or cancel others for legitimate reasons, um, especially public figures, celebrities uh, who said or did something something very harmful. So how do we make sense of all of these ideas? And here's how I think about it. When you call out someone, um, essentially what that is is to publicly hold someone accountable for something harmful that they said or did. Um, And honestly, we all need to be called out sometimes, but is it possible though, in, in our humanity, is it possible to be too eager to point out other people's mistakes? And then when you think about shaming, uh, that's to mock or embarrass or humiliate someone. Um, and this could be anything from posting a meme to uh, posting someone's private information publicly. Uh, and uh, really, when we do something that hurts others, um, we should feel ashamed of our actions. But do we have the right to hurt or to be cruel to people we disagree with or people we're angry with? And then when it comes to canceling, you know, that's to boycott someone that you believe needs to be held accountable for something they said or did. Um, And boycotts are an important uh, tool for creating positive change in the world. But how do we balance accountability with grace and forgiveness? See, calling out and shaming and canceling, they're all a little different, but where they uh, meet is what we call cancel culture. Um, it's the jumbled mess that, that we get when, we, uh, when, when legitimate concerns get lost in drama, in pettiness, cruelty, and even revenge. Um, and for the next couple of weeks, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. You know, the cancel culture typically is uh, about what happens online, but we struggle with these same issues in our all- offline relationships as well. Uh, with or without the internet, you know, we can all sometimes be critical, judgmental, impatient, uncaring, and cruel. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the kinds of people that most of us would rather cancel than love and what we can do about it uh, besides canceling uh, everyone we don't like. So uh, go ahead and grab your copy of God's Word or your phone or or whatever device you may have with the Bible on it. I want you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. Um, We're going to be in John chapter 4 to start off with. And as we get ready to dig into God's Word, you know, let's think about some, some hard truths about ourselves. You know, it's not easy to admit uh, that we're capable of treating people cruelly. And, and if I'm honest, you know, there are plenty of people that I've done just that to, plenty of people that I've canceled, and I'm not proud of it. 
Um, Because you think, have you ever avoided or even hated someone because they're different from you or they disagree with you? Uh, And you might think, well, no, not really. But if you're honest with yourself, I think you realize that there are people that you've decided to overlook or cancel in a way uh, because simply because they are different from you, Uh, like a celebrity or a a public figure who stood for things that you don't like. or maybe a, a former friend um, after you couldn't seem to agree on something important or a family member or classmate with opinions or beliefs that you disagree with, uh, a neighbor or peer who seemed different, weird or, or scary, um, someone whose culture, whose skin color, language, appearance or disability made you feel uncomfortable. See, this isn't new. Social media might be a, a modern invention but humans have always been quick to cancel people simply because they're different. Uh, In Jesus' time, people were often canceled by society when they uh, sinned, when they got sick, when they were poor or disabled or were from a different country or culture. Uh, And maybe that sounds horrible, but how often do people today get angry or even violent toward people uh, with a different skin color, with a different political view, uh, a different gender or religious belief? And short answer is quite often. You know, during Jesus' time, there was a major rift between the Jews, which was Jesus' people, and the Samaritans, which were people from a a neighboring region to uh, Israel. And, and, you know, picture the kind of rivalry rivalry between, um, you know, Georgia fans and Florida fans or maybe Alabama and Auburn fans. Um, But it was worse, way, way worse. Um, You know, there were major differences between the Jews and the Samaritans that led to major disagreements. Uh, And if social media had have existed back then, then the post between the Jews and the Samaritans uh, would have been really intense. and you know there was their ethnic and cultural differences that made them distrust each other. Um, they had political differences that made them angry at each other, uh, and their religious differences uh, made them hate each other. So for hundreds of years, you would never see a Jew and a Samaritan interact, let alone have a respectful, a respectful conversation uh, about the differences in their customs and their beliefs. But then Jesus showed up. Um, Let's look at John chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1, and we're reading a long bit here, so just hang on. But again, get your Bible uh, and just follow along with me. And John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, says this. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, He left Judea and went again to Galilee, and he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well, and it was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked me, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. And Jesus said, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, Give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go, call your husband, he told her and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have said, you have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, 
Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father now that you're on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And so they had this conversation. And uh, long story short, as a result of this conversation, this woman's life was forever changed. She believed that Jesus is the Messiah. And, and listen to what happened as she returned back to her, her town, back to her people, and told them all that Jesus said to her. Jump down with me to verse 39. It says, Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word that you so freely give to us. Lord, we ask right now that you help us to hear your voice through this lesson. Lord, speak to our hearts. Challenge us, God, to be who you've called us to be and to love who you've called us to love. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in this conversation, Jesus rose above the social and religious uh, restrictions of the day um, because according to those customs, it would have already been controversial for a respectable man like Jesus to speak with an unmarried woman as if she were his equal. On top of that, Jesus was a Jew talking to a Samaritan. But despite their differences, Jesus and the Samaritan woman both did something remarkable. Jesus valued the woman. Although Jews were accustomed to dismissing and hating Samaritans, Jesus never dismissed or was cruel to her. Instead, he valued her enough to start a conversation with her, to treat her with respect, and ultimately to share with her the good news that would change her life. And then the woman she valued Jesus. Although Samaritans were accustomed to dismissing and uh, hating Jews, this woman valued Jesus enough to give him a drink of water, to listen and learn from him, and then ultimately to tell others what she learned from him. I mean, imagine how things could be different if we acted this way with the people that we don't like or who we seriously disagree with. Everyone would have expected Jesus to either ignore this woman or condemn her. But by choosing to love, embrace, and value her, Jesus challenged his followers to love people who are different instead of rushing to cancel them. Because, because both Jesus and the Samaritan woman valued each other. Instead of letting their differences separate them, as a result, we see that many lives were changed. And now, whether you follow Jesus or not, I mean, there's a passage in the book of 2 Timothy that I think we can all learn from. Uh, if you will, flip over to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2. I mean, chapter 4, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, and now here, Paul, one of the uh, most important leaders in the early church is, is who wrote this. And the book of 2 Timothy is a letter that Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy uh, that he was mentoring. Uh, and here's one of the things he told him. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, Paul says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, but according to their own desires will multiply teachers for themselves because they have an itch to hear what they want to hear. They will turn away from hearing the truth and will turn aside to myths. 
So Paul warns Timothy that people tend to only believe or listen to things that they want to hear. Um, and he's specifically talking about theology, you know, what people believe about God. Um, but really, that's true about a, a lot of things, right? I mean, we prefer to hang around people who like the things that we like, who think uh, or talk like we do, people who behave like we behave, and ultimately people who believe the things that we believe. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that most of the time, but um, here's where it can go wrong. When we only spend time uh, with people who are just like us, we forget to value people who are different from us. We, we only learn from people who already agree with us, which really means we don't really learn anything new. You know, the Jews and the Samaritans, they both believed that God was okay with them ignoring and hating each other because they surrounded themselves with people who believed that too. And that resulted in them continuing to just be comfortable with that belief. But when Jesus crossed dividing lines to have a conversation with a woman who was different from him, he helped both sides see just how wrong they had all been. And through their conversation, Jesus challenged both the Jews and the Samaritans to love people who are sometimes the hardest to love, people who are different than us. Our neighbors who may not share our culture, our values, our behaviors, our skin color, our language, our beliefs. And through Jesus' example, he challenges you to do the same thing, to love people who aren't like you. So now what? You know, what, what can we do now that we know what God's word has to say about the cancel culture that we so easily get caught up in? Well, first of all, and most important, we need to understand that it's okay to have differences. You know, the Jews and the Samaritans, they had a lot of differences in their customs and their culture, but did you notice that Jesus didn't seem interested in addressing all of those uh, differences or expecting the Samaritan woman to become Jewish? Jesus didn't tell her she needed to change all of her customs in order to follow him. He didn't tell her she needed to talk or act or dress certain, a certain way or, or sing a certain kind of worship song. I mean, right now, all over the world, followers of Jesus are worshiping in different ways that are unique to their culture and context. And those differences aren't something to, to fear. I mean, if they're true Christ followers, I mean, this, these differences, they are beautiful. I mean, there are Jesus followers all over the world of every culture and skin color speaking more languages than you can name. And even within the same country, the same cities, or even the same church, you'll find followers of Jesus who worship, think, pray, talk, vote, and act differently. And that's more than okay. It's actually good. The capital C church is meant to be diverse. We were never meant to all be the same in every aspect of our lives. But there is, there is one central thing that we all have to be in common, and that's Jesus Christ. To believe what the Bible teaches us about him, that he came to this earth born of a virgin, that he lived a perfect sinless life and then died a sinner's death on the cross, that he was buried in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead on the third day. And when we turn from our sin, asking God to forgive us and put our faith and trust in who Jesus is and what the Bible says he did, we then become true members of the church of Jesus Christ. We then have the promise of eternal life and a future home with him in heaven, in the presence of God Almighty for all of eternity. And that's the only way to heaven. And the thing is, we're all united in Jesus. But being united doesn't mean we all have to be the same. It means we're loved the same. It means we all have the same access to God through Jesus. And now don't miss this fact. If you miss everything else that I say tonight when it comes to loving others, do not miss this. If you are not already a follower of Jesus, 
If you've never put your faith and trust in Him alone as Lord and Savior, then it will be impossible for you to love others this way. Impossible. If you are a Christ follower already, and, and, and through that relationship with Jesus, then you've got the Holy Spirit living in and through you, giving you everything you need to be able to love others, no matter who they are or what they do. You know, Jesus' death and his resurrection destroyed the argument that only certain people are welcome in God's family or kingdom. Jesus died for everyone, including me, including you, the Samaritans, and the people that we disagree with or struggle to love. In Jesus and through him alone, we're all invited to become children of God, differences and all. You know, you're probably not angry at any Samaritans right now, but I'm guessing there is a person in your life or maybe a group of people that you do struggle to love. And that may be because of your differences. It may be because of something you disagree on. And you may not hate them, but you might be overlooking or avoiding them. You might be uncomfortable around them. You might be angry with or disgusted by them. You might be afraid of them. You might be mocking them. And so I ask, who is that for you? Is it a person? Is it a group of people? You know, we all sometimes struggle with, to love people who aren't like us. And I know it's easier to, to cancel someone than it is to love them. It's easier to ignore than to start a conversation with them. It's easier to, to hate or mock them or avoid them than it is to reach out to them. But that's not what Jesus challenged us to do. You know, just like Jesus confronted the Jews with the reality that God loved Samaritans, the people that you're thinking about, the people that you struggle to love, well, they're loved by God too. You know, they may be different than you, uh, but we're both made in the image of God Almighty and the Imago Dei. And that makes you valuable and worthy of love, and that makes them valuable and worthy of love. And I want to challenge you right now to take some time, either as soon as this video is over, or, or better yet, you can just go ahead and hit the pause button and do this. You know, grab some paper, a notebook, or a sticky pad, or, or just any, anything to write on. Grab something to write on, uh, and write, I want you to write down the person the type or the group of people that you struggle to love. I mean, pray about it and ask God to reveal to you those people in your life that you really struggle to love, people that you may be disagree disagreeing with uh, and, and you, know, you know who they are. And just write their names down. Be specific if you've got names um, or if it's just a type of people, be specific about that. And then what I want you to do is place that list in, in, in somewhere where you will see it often and use it as a reminder that, you know, people who aren't like you, people that you may disagree with, people that you may not get along with, people that are hard to love, they're valuable and they are worthy of love and pray for them. Pray for them and ask God to help you to see the opportunities that he will give you to share love with them and ultimately to share your faith in Jesus with them. And this will not always be easy. We're never told it would be. You know, there will be people who are hard for you to to understand, hard for you to connect with, um, hard for you to care about because of your differences. But we always have to remember that the people you struggle to love are made in the same image of God as you are. We need to remember that our differences do not have to divide us. And ultimately, we can love each other even when we don't agree. So if you want to love like Jesus, and I hope that you do, then love people who aren't like you. Don't be so quick to cancel them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you once again, Lord, for your word. 
Um, God, you are God Almighty. You created everything. You created everyone. And Lord, when we read that creation story, Lord, in Genesis, your word says that we, as mankind, are made in your image. We are the only thing, Lord, that you made in the image of yourself. And so, God, I pray that you help us to be a true reflection of that, especially, Lord, those of us who call you Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus, those of us who have put our faith and trust in you. Lord, our job now is to go out and share your love with others and to be a light, to be an example, to be a true reflection of who you are. So, God, I pray that you help us to do just that. And, Lord, when we encounter people that we don't agree with, people that we uh, struggle to love, God, I pray that you help us to remember the truth that that person or that group of people, they are made in the same image of you as I am, as we are. So, God, help us to, to love others enough to be willing to put aside those differences and not let them divide us. But, Lord, help them to, to, to draw us to people. Lord, because, Lord, honestly, people who struggle, people who are mean to us, people who mistreat us, God, what they ultimately need is you, Lord Jesus. And if we know you already as personal Lord and Savior, then we have, God, your spirit living in and through us. And that allows us to be able to share your truth with them. That gives us the strength, Lord. You give us the strength through your spirit to love people. Love people who are hard to love. Love people who are mean to us. Love people who we disagree with. Love people who belong to a different political party or uh, like a different sports team than us. Lord, you call us to love them. You command us to love them. So, Lord, help us to see, Lord, the ways that we can do that each and every day. And Lord, I do pray right now, as I already mentioned, Lord, there may be someone listening to this or watching this video right now, Lord, that doesn't know you already as Lord and Savior. And Lord, when we talk about loving others, Lord, we hear uh, the world talk about that all the time, that all we need is love, all we need to do is love one another. But true love, Lord, only comes through you. True, genuine, unconditional love only comes through a relationship with Jesus as our Lord and Savior because, Lord, you are the only one who can take the sinfulness and the hate and the evil out of our hearts, Lord, and replace it with your love, Lord, which, as we've seen through your word, is unconditional. Lord, as we see here in this story of Lord, you, Lord Jesus, talking with this Samaritan woman and loving her enough to put aside those differences, Lord, you call us to do the same. And Lord, I pray that, again, if there's someone that doesn't know you that's listening to this, Lord, that they will uh, turn away from their sin, that they will turn to you, Lord Jesus, and believe uh, that, you were who you, that you are who you are, that you came to this earth, you were born of a virgin, you lived a perfect sinless life, let, yet you, you, you were tortured and beaten and mistreated, and ultimately you were hung and nailed to that cross, Lord, and you died on that cross. And through your death, God, you paid the price that I owed because of my sin. You paid the price that we all owed because of our sin. Lord, then you were buried in that borrowed tomb, but Lord, you rose from the dead. God raised you from the dead on that third day. And your word tells us that if we will just believe that, then we will be saved. So Lord, help us to believe that. Lord, help, uh, help those that don't know you right now to put their trust in you and begin to live in a way, Lord, that ultimately honors you and shows that love that you've shown them. So, Lord, again, we thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Be with us as we all go about our days. Lord, again, help us to be salt and light and show others who you are and how you love them. And we'll pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.